Hello, my name is Dr. Adam Lorenzetti. I'm a shoulder and elbow specialist at Ortho Virginia. And thank you for joining us today uh, to talk about shoulder arthritis and treatment options for it. So the normal shoulder um, comprises of the ball and socket joint, which each layer, each bone is covered in a smooth layer of cartilage. Uh, and that's the gap you see on that x-ray there is, is that those bones are touching, but the cartilage is in, in between them. And the cartilage lines the end of the bones, it cushions the impact of the bones and gives it a smooth gliding surface. So the normal joint should slide smoothly around, um, letting us move, bend, lift, carry without pain. As we age and through a variety of conditions, you can get breakdown of that cartilage. You lose that smooth surface so things don't run and slide well. The joint space starts to narrow and you can get create bone spurs, catching, clicking, and popping. And on the left side of the screen is the smoother cartilage and toward the right where you can see that there's frayed ends of cartilage. There's chunks of cartilage missing, getting down to bare bone. And the x-rays below show where we have two examples of bone on bone arthritis. Where we've lost complete joint space, the bone's getting harder, uh, it's getting rougher, less smooth, and the surfaces don't match as well anymore. So instead of a smooth ball and socket, you get two rough surfaces that don't quite fit together anymore. And what happens is over time, you get a progression of pain, worsening with activity, especially with load and weight bearing. Uh, it tends to interfere with sleep as that pain increases throughout the day and you try to go to sleep at night. You're trying to relax and you can feel that pain more and more, as well as loss of motion. Then, then what often happens is, well, it hurts to move, so I'll stop using that arm or using that joint as much. You start getting muscle wasting because you're not using it or you, uh, pushing with it. Uh, you get clicking, cracking, and popping, which you call crepitus, as well as swelling, and sometimes it can be also painful to touch. Uh, we always, you know, with any arthritis, we do non-operative treatment first line for anything. Uh, especially when it's mild, uh, we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, which are Motrin, Aleve, Diclofenac, Meloxicam, Felidine. There's many of them out there. Uh, oral or corticosteroid injections. That's when people say cortisol injections. We inject a variety of different types of steroids depending on the joint condition. They can help decrease the inflammation that's involved in that process of arthritis. Uh, physical therapy, mainly to help with mobility. So is a arthritic loose joint feels better than an arthritic stiff joint. So we work with therapy to provide strength around the shoulder, um, provide improved range of motion, get people to move, and activity modification, which means we don't do the things that hurt a lot. If you're working out of the gym and certain movements hurt, well, don't do those. Change the way you lift things, change the activities you do. And sometimes that can be very helpful, but of those activities that you wanna do, golf, swimming, they're the thing that causes you pain, but also gives you enjoyment of life, that becomes a problem. And so when do we consider surgery? It's mainly when these things uh, start interfering with our life. It's a quality of life decision. So it interferes with the activities that you want to do, swimming, golf, playing with your grandchildren, uh, lifting weights, and anything that provides you enjoyment and makes life fun and enjoyable. Then there's loss of independence. Can you brush your hair? change clothes, bathing, wash your back, stopping where you're trying to just do the self-care activities at home. And then especially sleep or work when uh, you can't do your job or get a good night's sleep, that's that's a major problem. So any shoulder replacement generally begins with a incision on the front of the shoulder between the uh, two main muscles up, up above the shoulder, which is the pectoralis that's on your chest and the deltoid, which is that outside muscle. And then you have to go toward the front of the shoulder. There are the rotator cuff muscles, which we won't get into too depth uh, about today. But to access that, you have to open up the front of the shoulder. So we can expose our ball and socket, which are now worn out. And you remove the top of the ball to resect that area of bone out. And then on the cup side, you smooth it out to put a new cup on there. And generally, we use a plastic surface, similar to the plastics that are used in hip and knee replacements. And on the ball side, we use a stem or implant that goes down inside the upper arm bone plus a new metal ball on top of that to serve as our new ball and our new socket and so on the left is the before picture of that bone on bone arthritis and the right is a picture where we see the new stem down inside the bone the new metal ball and we can't see the plastic cup though if you look carefully you can see the gap between the bone and the ball now as well as uh, just inside the glenoid on the cup side 
you'll see these little shadows where the pegs for the implant are. But that provides us our new bearing surface that should not cause pain anymore and we allow it to get back to improve our range of motion, our strength and our activities. And then this is another example that this is a little more of a more uh, newer implant that we use. And so instead of the bigger, longer stems from the older implant in some bones, especially if it's good solid bone, you can use these metaphyseal uh, fixation stems, which means, or we'll call them stemless, but they fix into the, the bone at the top, not having to go down the shaft. If that bone quality is good and the body will grow into that implant to make it solid. So we have to take less bone for these types of implants. The what to expect is the success rates on most arthritic surgeries like this are 90 to 95% where people are happy. So they have improved pain relief, improved function with improved range of motion, ability to perform their activities, improved quality of life, uh, return to independence, being able to do the activities they want to do. And to, that, that was what's called an anatomic shoulder replacement because you're replacing the ball with the ball in a cup with a cup. So the other replacement option that people have often heard about is called a reverse replacement which really has to do with the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff is the muscles that help hold the ball in the socket. So the deltoid muscles, that bigger muscle on the outside, and there's several muscles that come off the shoulder blade that attach to the ball, and they pull that ball into the socket, keep it centered and keep it stabilized. The next slide. And classically, if you have a large tear of the rotator cuff, the shoulder becomes unbalanced. The ball starts to rise up due to the pull of the deltoid muscle. So it becomes this unbalanced. It's like letting the air out on one tire of your car. Not only is that tire ruined, but if you drive for a while, you'll start ruining the other tires faster because they're now unbalanced. They're putting too much pressure and wear on those. So this can degrade the cartilage as well because now it's sloppier, it's moving around, and you'll start getting more wear at the top of the ball and the top of the cup as that ball lifts up. And so similarly to just classic osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis that happens with age this cuff tear arthropathy can occur and it tends to, as that ball rises up it hits the bone above as you can see on the x-ray picture where it's now touching the bone above it and then wearing preferentially on the top of the cuff and so in this situation is when we use our reverse shoulder arthroplasty which reverses the ball and socket so now you have the socket on the scapula the shoulder blade or sorry the ball on the uh, scapula shoulder blade but the socket is now on the ball side or on the humerus. And this creates a more stable construct that's different than how our shoulder was made, but it allows us to change the load relationship and compensate for the lack of a rotator cuff and rebalance the shoulder. And so, in, you know, there you can see how now the ball is on the, the cup side and the humeral head has been pushed down from that position where it was touching that bone above, which we call the acromion restabilizing joint to allow it to move and uh, decrease that person's pain. And then on this is again, similarly uh, on this person, they had bad osteoarthritis where the ball wasn't sitting up high, but in certain situations where they have rotator cuff tears that aren't very huge or bony wear, we can use these reverse replacements. And this is a version of one that's also uh, smaller with bone and growth. So we don't have to use those big, long stems all the time. And then here's just a third version as well uh, with somebody without much arthritis on the ball and socket side, the head sitting up higher and they had a large rotator cuff tear that couldn't be fixed. So they're progressing onto that cuff tear arthropathy. Um, and over time, if he had left this alone, they would start uh, bone on bone arthritis as well. So the other indication for these reverse shoulder arthroplasties, not just for arthritis, but you can use them for the massive rotator cuff tears. Uh, that are non-repairable with arthritis, failed rotator cuff surgery, failed fractures um, for uh, acute fracture repairs, failed other replacements, and uh, other severe bony deformities that we can't use an anatomic shoulder replacement, which are things that you know, right now we're more focused on the arthritis for this talk, but I'm happy to answer some questions on this as well if you have questions. All right. Thank you so much. So we will be answering questions submitted earlier and questions submitted live. Um, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. So the first question is, at what age do people generally start experiencing symptoms of shoulder arthritis? So it can be at any age in some sense, uh, but generally it's in older, you start getting the fifth or sixth decade of life. Uh, most arthritis is sort of wear and tear of age 
and everything sort of wears out at some point, unfortunately. Um, so usually we'll see people in their 60s, sometimes 70s. Now it can happen earlier if it's a result of a traumatic injury, shoulder dislocations when you're in your 20s can lead to arthritis in your 40s um, or fractures where the blood supply has been compromised. So these things can sometimes happen at a younger age or we'll see them sometimes in like the early 40s with uh, power lifters who were bench pressing three to 400 pounds. They'll sometimes have symptoms earlier than you uh, expect just on age. Thank you. How can you tell if your shoulder pain is arthritis or something else like a rotator cuff tear or frozen shoulder? So no, you can't uh, always tell just based on the history alone. So we do use x-ray align uh, orthopedics. So one of our first steps is when you come for evaluation is getting an x-ray and that can tell you some uh, information right away is if you see narrowing of the joint, you see bone spurs or we'll call osteophytes if the bone looks uneven or rough, that'll give us the clue that this is from arthritis as opposed to the rotator cuff. Then on x-ray, you can't see the rotator cuff, but we can see some changes of the ball uh, where the rotator cuff inserts should look smooth. As that rotator cuff starts to tear to generally over time, the, those bumps will start getting rough and uneven. And especially if that ball is sitting high in the socket, but the socket looks normal, then we kind of know it can be some chronic rotator cuff issues. But to look at the rotator cuff, it's the best to have an MRI eventually. So that can be part of our workup as well. Thank you. Should people avoid lifting heavy weight to avoid worsening arthritis and avoid surgery? Uh, yes, uh, to some aspect. So yeah, the super, super heavy lifting, you can kind of only do at a younger age. And as we get older, you know, we don't want to be 55 years old and trying to max out a 255 pound bench press and as we develop arthritis the activities we can participate in start to decrease so same as uh, somebody who has knee arthritis they may love running but at some point you have to cut down on how many miles you're running and you go into cycling or swimming or water aerobics same for the shoulders is you can lift weights and our goal is to allow you to lift to maintain strength and lean muscle mass as we get older even if you're in 50s or 60s with mild arthritis who like you to lift some weights but you cut down on the heaviness of the weights we'd rather have you do lighter weights with more repetitions to gain tone and strength as opposed to just trying to get force because the more we kind of work those arthritic joints the more painful overall they'll become thank you what function do you have after a reverse shoulder replacement are you more limited than after an anatomic shoulder replacement? So the function can be very good. So the most classic studies showed that the anatomic shoulder replacements had about 20-30% more motion on average than the reverse shoulder replacements. Now those initial studies were done on patients um, where the anatomics were done on people that had a good rotator cuff to begin with and the reverses were done on People had no rotator cuff, so you were already starting from a worse starting position. Um, so that made sense. As we've redesigned and you know throughout the medical community, we've gotten better at the reverse shoulder replacements. And when they're used for different applications, they can have equivalent or the similar to the same results as a anatomic replacement in the right selected patient. So you can get people to back to near full range of motion um, with both types of replacements. And so you just have to based on a number of patient factors and what you're looking for, they can dictate which way you go, even if the rotator cuff's intact. Thank you. Is there a risk yeah. from not having surgery? Can it get to the point where it's not repairable? Uh, yes, the some, uh, yes. So there's, you know, Surgery always carries an inherent risk. There's all no surgery is 100% uh, safe. Um, just like most activities in life are never 100% safe. Um, there is a, with arthritis, uh, for just talking about replacements, generally there is a point that you can always repair and replace that joint, except on issues with health. So there's no age cutoff for a shoulder replacement or other replacement. There's really a health cutoff. So you can have a super active, healthy 85-year-old that's a candidate for replacement. And you can have a 65-year-old that has 
multiple medical problems that isn't healthy enough to potentially have their replacement. And there are people that it's, we try to have you put off your replacement as long as you can, because the older you are when you have a replacement, the longer it's likely to last, because the less miles you put on it, and the more likely it is to last the rest of your lifetime. Now, having said that, there are a couple of cases where people, if you you know, which is maybe the right decision for them at the time, put off on having a replacement when they're active and healthy. Then five years down the road, they have had a heart attack, their diabetes is worse, and, and you start becoming a situation where you may not be a good surgical candidate anymore. And But your arm's not functioning well enough for you, but the risk have now greatly increased. And so there are sometimes windows in somebody's life where they're at appropriate age, they're bad enough arthritis, and that may be a better window to have it done than waiting too long where there might not be healthy enough to have it done anymore. And that's an unfortunate situation. Um, sometimes I have options, but then that's when the cardiologist, the endocrinologist, you know, the doctors say, hmm, you know, this is not safe enough for you and we don't get to make that call. Thank you. Can exercise or physical therapy help relieve pain from shoulder arthritis? And if they can, how does somebody know which exercises to do? So, yes, um, they can help with uh, decreasing some pain. Um, now, if it's bone and bone arthritis, sometimes it won't, sometimes it does. Uh, we always recommend some physical therapy as a first line treatment because it never hurts uh, the person or it doesn't, there's no major side effect other than pain um, when you're doing exercises. One is to always try to gain as much range of motion as you can. Because if we stretch out that shoulder joint as it gets arthritic, it wants to tighten up on us. If we can stretch it out and you have less pain with more range of motion, great. There are some people, they go through a month or two of therapy and it just feels worse every time they're exercising. And we know they're just not responding to therapy or their arthritis is so bad that they can't improve with that. Helping strengthen the muscles around does help as well. And then knowing which exercises to do that's a good option to start with therapies. They can help guide that, train you on some exercises and lifting to do. Then they're trying to do lower impact activities. Like for people who like to weight lift, one of the first things I always tell them to stop doing is just sort of a standard overhead press. Just puts a lot of stress on the shoulders. So we back that away. You start going away from free weights to the machines or to a, just a regular bar. And then you can sort of move down on how heavy a weight you can do. And you know, it's a little bit of trial and error. It's like, well, I can do this and it doesn't hurt. Great. Well, this other person tries that and hurts too much. They drop down 20% of the weights and it doesn't hurt. Great. That's, that's what they can do. Thank you. Does shoulder surgery when you're younger increase your chance of shoulder arthritis? It can on some cases. We know that dislocations increase the risk of shoulder arthritis. Um, so having surgery to correct that can decrease your chance of having shoulder arthritis in the future, where, meaning each time somebody dislocates, that's a common reason for somebody in their teens to 20s to have uh, shoulder surgery at a young age is their shoulder keeps on popping out of socket. If you don't fix that, the more you pop out and more unstable, more likely you're to develop arthritis. Now, the surgery can reduce the rate of arthritis if we stabilize the shoulder, but Sometimes that die has been cast, and if there's been some damage from a younger age, you're already on that uh, train to get some arthritis, and the hope is you're pushing that off as far later in life as possible. And then there has been um, surgeries in the past that have increased the risk of arthritis that generally are not done anymore, um, that are more historical surgeries from when we didn't have certain techniques that we have nowadays. And then anytime you operate around the joint, um, there is the risk of injuring th things around the joint. Now we've gotten better with that. There used to be something called a pain pump that they used for a while that led to really early arthritis. So we don't use those anymore. That's been out of, uh, haven't been used for I think 10 to 15 years now. Um, and then other surgeries that you have to have as younger, if you have fractures, if the blood supply to the ball has been injured because of that fracture, not necessarily from the surgery, that can sometimes lead to early arthritis um, called post-traumatic arthritis. 
Thank you. You know, what is the recovery process like after a shoulder replacement? So how long will somebody um, be in the hospital or the operatory or the surgery center? How long will they be off of work and so on? And so some of this is dependent on the patient. So more and more shoulder replacements, just like hip and knee replacements are being done uh, outpatient now. So we are better with pain control, uh, local nerve blocks, multimodal pain strategies. Um, and one nice thing with the shoulder, as opposed to the hip and knees, you don't have to walk on it. So if your shoulder's numb and feels good and you're healthy, you can go home the same day. Uh, now, each patient's a little different. So as you start having more medical problems, if you're having a history of heart disease, COPD, lung disease, some of those things, that surgery is more likely to take place in a hospital setting and more likely to spend overnight. Um, most people, if they're going to spend overnight or stay in the hospital, it's only for one day. Where I'd say probably 80% of my to 90% of my shoulder replacements are home the same day. Now, most of those are in the outpatient setting or surgery centers, and some of those are at the hospital where we want a little more monitoring based on age or other things. Um, but then there are certain patients based on the number of criteria that you keep in the hospital. Um, Pain-wise, we usually use the anesthesiologist. We use nerve blocks and numb the shoulder up for a few days after surgery. Uh, everybody's pain is a little different, but generally, often if you're dealing with bone and bone arthritis, within a week or two, you're already feeling better pain-wise than you were before because you have this sharp gnawing pain from the grinding all the time. We take that away with surgery, which is nice. Then you spend about six weeks in the sling because we want the the metal parts of the implant are coated to allow the bone to grow into them. So we don't do a lot of motion early on to allow the body and the bone to grow into that implant to get a solid connection. And then we start physical therapy about six weeks post-op, start with the range of motion. So first week or two are painful. Now, some people use one pain pill total and some people use 20. Everybody's a little different. Um, then it's a boring month as you're waiting to get to do stuff. We have a couple exercises, can wrist and elbow range motion, and pendulums and shoulder shrugs to do early on. And then the real therapy starts around that six weeks. So you're a little more painful at that period, but it's more of that stiff, I haven't moved this in a while pain um, that you work through and by three to four months, you're feeling much better. It can take six months to feel really good. Um, so it's not a super quick process. Um, but usually between that three or four month period, you're like, oh, I'm glad I had this happen. And then it can take up to a year to get as good as you're going to get. So that last four to six months are getting the last 10 to 15 degrees of motion, getting a little more strength going on. Thank you. Do shoulder braces help with shoulder arthritis pain? And do massages help with shoulder arthritis pain? So there isn't any shoulder brace that can really help with pain. Now, some people would want a sling or a brace because the movement causes pain because that joint is rough, gets irritated when we move. The problem with that is the less you use it, the stiffer it's going to get and the weaker it's going to get. So it's, yes, it helps with some pain, but you end up with a less functional shoulder. So it's not something I'd ever recommend outside of a day or two, but the more you're using that sling or brace, it, it just leads to more stiffness. So there's no good braces just for arthritis. Where on knees, they have certain braces that kind of force the knee more straight. We don't have that with the shoulder. And then massages can help just for, you know, your muscles get tight and stiff and sore. Um, and then there's no harm in the massage. So if it feels good, makes it feel better. Great. Uh, there's no harm. Of, nobody's therapist should be yanking on the arm or twisting in a crazy rear way. But if it's just relieving those muscles that are sore because the shoulder doesn't move as much as it used to, that that is okay and can help with some of the pain. Thank you. Are calcium deposits on the shoulder and shoulder arthritis the same thing or different things? So they're generally different things. There are some calcium deposits that can just happen with age. Usually we see that in like the rotator cuff, something we call calcific tendinitis, where the the body puts a little calcium within the tendon. So that's sort of a separate entity. And similarly, as we age, we have calcium in our bloodstream because it's used by different organs in our body and different cells for nerve signaling and muscle contraction. And then sometimes that calcium gets deposited in certain places, kidney stones, uh, in our arteries for um 
uh, cardiac issues. Now with shoulder arthritis, the calcium deposits we generally see are those bone spurs or something we call loose bodies as that joint is grinding around. You can break off a little cartilage, break off a little bone, and then they form these little bony balls that sort of sit around inside the joint. Uh, they're more of a sign or symptom of something going on as opposed to the actual problem. Um, but you can have some bone spurs that grow off similarly to the calcium deposit, but that's they're somewhat separate, different though. You can have increased calcium deposits around that arthritic joint just because the body's responding to that uh, irritation as well. Thank you. How many cortisone injections can you get for shoulder pain and how long do they last? So there's no definitive limit. We know that the injection itself is not health per se. Now, a one-time injection or one very uh, rarely isn't necessarily bad. We know that um, you know, the more injections you have, the weaker overall that is can make the tissue and can cause some cartilage damage um, if you're having a lot of them. So sort of the older days, somebody, there are people that get a sterile injection once a month for years. We know that's not good, but having one here, or one there over the years, is not necessarily bad. Now, there is some data that says if you have a lot of injections that can raise your risk of infection app for a shoulder replacement afterwards and if we do an injection we don't replace a shoulder for three months because it changes the environment around the shoulder and our immune system around that shoulder um, there are some patients that are as they get older and unhealthy aren't a good candidate for a shoulder replacement so they may have two or three injections a year for a number of years because that's their only option and we take that the risk of those injections is way less than the risk of trying to do a surgery. If you're a younger, healthier person, you're not trying to do as many because you know that can compromise your surgery later. But each patient's a little different than what you're looking for. Uh, um, and then how long they last, and sometimes they don't cure the arthritis, they don't create more cartilage or help that, but they're calming down the inflammation. And as you have arthritis, you have these flares where the pain gets bad, and then it gets better. And the worse arthritis and the longer it's happening, those flares increase in length, meaning instead of three or four days of pain, it might be a week, later it might be two weeks. And then the intensity, how much pain you're having also increases. So they get more common and worse. And the injections, usually when you add them, well, sometimes you might have this flare with mild arthritis, and then injection helps you for six months or a year or it calms the pain down enough for a number of years if it's only a mild irritation. As time goes on, well, two years later you come back, hey, it's flared up again. Well, that one might only last six months. The one after that might only last a month. And there's some point where you're saying, hey, if they're not helping much or not helping in my condition, then they're not worth doing because of their own risks. But surgery has its own risks. So it's always worth trying to do injection mostly before doing a surgery for most patients at least once. Thank you. Can you have both shoulders replaced at the same time? So I would say no, it's never quite a good idea. And the easiest way to think about it is, you know, if you're married or have a loved one uh, who's wiping your butt after surgery, because you got two hands that you can't really use. So you don't think about it often as like, it's tough dealing with one arm kind of not using and just being one-handed for a while. If you're trying to do both at the same time, you can't really eat, you can't really take care of yourself, you can't do your things in daily life. When you start thinking about, if you think about like just walking around with both hands at your side and not using them, it's not gonna go very well. So usually we want about three months between replacements because we don't want you to fall, we don't want you to have issues. Um, so I'm not, I wouldn't tell anybody ever to have both at the same time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lorenzetti. That is all the time that we have for today. Would you like to close? Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everybody listening in today and I hope we can find information if you have any other questions. I'm happy to see you. If you would like to make an appointment with Dr. Lorenzetti, you can go to orthovirginia.com. Thank you. Thanks very much.